Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fourth installment of Nuclear Heat on WrestlingInc.com. I am, of course, your host, Vince Russo, and the show is called Nuclear Heat uh, because usually, you know, this is the show I go off on a little bit of a tirade, a little bit of, of a rant of what's bothering me at the time. But today's show is going to be a little different. Today's show is going to be a little historical. Uh, it's going to be a look back at, um, you know, really a historical date in professional wrestling. I, you know, I, I have to laugh because I watch so many, you know, Raws now where they say this is a historical Raw and this is a, you know, historical, you know, pay-per-view. And the fact of the matter is nothing happens. But uh, on October 5th, 1997, it was a historical bad blood pay-per-view for the World Wrestling Federation at the time. No question about it. Here we are 18 years later, and that date in time, that date in history, uh, has a significant bearing uh, on the WWE uh, going all the way to the present time and today. Because on October 5th, 1997, in St. Louis, Missouri, Bad Blood pay-per-view, that was the very first tell-in-the-cell match between The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels. But not only that, on that very same night, that was the debut of The Undertaker's brother, Kane. You know, if you go back and you look at a lot of the shows from the Attitude Era, a lot of um, pay-per-views from that era, more than one significant thing happened uh, in a show. I just finished watching a Raw. I think it was March 2nd, 1998, uh, where basically Mike Tyson joined T uh, DX, but also The Undertaker returned. Uh, so, you know, th th there were many shows where more than one significant piece of history happened. But this show, October 5th, 1997, Hell in the Cell, <clears throat> was very, very significant going into this weekend's pay-per-view. Now, I want to first talk about, you know, how the Hell in the Cell concept came about because at that time, the creative team was myself, Jim Cornette, and Vince McMahon. And honestly, I had to go back to Wikipedia to refresh my memory uh, and the first thing I read in Wikipedia was that in in one of his interviews, uh, you know, uh, Jim Cornette took credit for coming up with the Hell in the Cell concept, for coming up with the idea of the cage. Uh, and quite frankly, I'll be honest with you, I don't remember it um, I, specifically being Jim, but you know what? It probably was Jim because Jim was more of the match guy. I was more of the creative guy, more of the idea guy. And I'll get into that in a minute. But, you know, when reading it said, you know, Jim had taken the idea from war games and, you know, that's where he came up with the concept of the structure. How the conversation started was, you know, Originally, it was a, a, a cage match between Taker and Shawn Michaels. But of course, you know, both of these guys were in the prime of their careers. And we wanted, uh, you know, to have some kind of a match where they would be able to do more. Keep in mind, this is 1997. At that point in time, the cage, you know, came down on the ring. So you had to stay within that cage. So the participants were very limited to what they could do. So the idea was we wanted to put them in a cage, but we wanted to give them room outside the ring, especially, you know, Shawn Michaels in this match outside of the ring. So they could, you know, they could obviously do more. So the idea of, um, you know the idea of Jim Cornette coming up with the with the uh, with, with the cage and the structure of the of the cell. Uh, you know, kind of makes sense. And like I said, I don't remember the details, but I wouldn't doubt it. One thing I do remember is the name Hell in the Cell. I know that originated from me. And as I said, I was more of the creative guy. And listen, this ain't rocket science. Let, let me get that straight. So I'm not telling you this to put myself over of an idea or a name that I came up with 18 years ago. That's not important. You know, the first thing I do when we need to come up with a name or a character or this and that, 
one of the easiest things to do is to rhyme. You know, what rhymes with what? Uh, it's so elementary and it's so easy. So, you know, what I was thinking of is Taker, Sean, you know, being locked inside a cell. You know, this was a cell like a jail cell. Well, hell in the cell. Really, really simple. So I know I pitched uh, the name for it. Boom, we were all set October 5th, 1977 for the Hell in the Cell match. Now, here's something I want to explain. You know, I, 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 I get so wound up and so upset when, when things are repeated about Vince Russo over and over and over and over again because my detractors want you to believe certain things about me. So no matter how many interviews I give, no, no matter you know what I say, they stick to their same lines and their same stories without any um, uh, background, anything, just hoping it sticks. And one of the things, you know, my detractors will always tell you is, oh, Vince Russo takes credit for everything and doesn't give credit to anybody. Well, to be honest with you, if you if you really care, uh, you can go back and read either one of my books, you know, Forgiven or How WCW Killed Vince Russo. In my own words, uh, you can clearly see how it is my pleasure to put other people over. I thrive on putting other people over and putting them up on a pedestal. And the reason I say that, because here we are 18 years later, getting ready to have an, uh, another Hell in the Cell match, when that night in 1997, it could have been one and done with Hell in the Cell, depending on the match. It was a new concept. It was the first time we were using the cell. And let's face it, it could have bombed. But going in, we were very, very confident, you know, with Taker in his prime, with Sean in his prime, you had two of the, of the best in the business in that cell. So my point is, those guys, go back and watch the match. It is an unbelievable match. They tore the house down in St. Louis uh, that night. They had no regard for their bodies. They, they gave it all up in that cell in an effort to get the concept over. And here we are 18 years later, and the hell in the cell is still being used. That's a testament to the greatness of both The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels, the fact that they were in that very first match. They were going to either make the cage or we were never going to see it again. But solely on their performance and their performance alone, it became a staple uh, in the WWE. Here we are 18 years later uh, ready to have another Hell in the Cell match. So all the credit in the world. Uh, goes to The Undertaker and goes to Shawn Michaels, you know, for that very, very first match that clearly, clearly put the put the cell on uh, on the map and and made it an iconic structure, you know, two decades later. And and you can't take that away from them. And I, and I got to tell you, you know, you can go to YouTube, you can go to WWENetwork.com. There, I just plugged the WWENetwork.com. And, um, you know, you can watch this match, but this match was no doubt uh, off the charts. The cell worked. And I have to say something else. <laughs> the fact that The Undertaker, um, 18 years after the fact, is stepping in a cell again is just absolutely, it's, 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 it's almost unbelievable. I, I mean, I, I'll be totally honest with you. When you really sit and think about this man and, and, and his career and what he's put his body through and the injuries he suffered, many that I witnessed firsthand, you know, listen, I, I got to be honest with you. There wasn't a night, you know, Undertaker had a bad back. I, I mean, he, you know, and but he never sold it. You know, he always kept it to himself, but man, after every match, when I would, you know, sort him out, 
uh, in order to thank him and in order to, you know, just, you know, tell him how tremendous the match was. I can't tell you how many nights I would find him in the in, in the annals of, of the uh, of the locker room laid out on the floor with the trainer in excruciating pain, getting his back worked on after just tearing the house down where you would have thought he was 150 percent. I cannot tell you how many times I witnessed that, which is a testament to the man. That's why 18 years later, to be stepping in a cage again, especially with the Brock Lesnar. Listen, we all know this is a work, but we all know that Brock Lesnar is a very, uh, you know, physical human being. Uh, you know, Taker's go his body is going to have to have to absorb some level of punishment. To do this 18 years after the fact is just, it's almost inhuman. It's unbelievable and just a testament, you know, to the man uh, and, and to what he has given to this sport. Um, just, there'll, there'll never be another like him. Let's go on to the second significant thing that happened this night. And it was it was the debut of the character Kane that Paul Barra had been talking about for weeks and weeks and weeks. There used to be a trick to writing, you know, Raw at that time, the Attitude Era. And what what we used to try to do is we used to try to set the table. So, you know, build up a character, build them up, build them up, build them up. So by the time they made their debut, you were expecting them, you were anticipating them, and the pop was going to be there. And this was probably one of those points in time where we had built the anticipation to such a level uh, that we blew the roof off that off the building when we first saw the Undertaker, uh, his brother Kane, uh, make his debut here at Bad Blood, you know, I, I, Vince McMahon was on commentary, I believe, and when I when I hear the call to this day, I get goosebumps because Vince repeats over and over, and, and I'm pretty sure it's Vince. You know that that's got to be Kane. That's got to be Kane. That's got to be Kane. And you know, you know, to me, like that was the artistry of the writing. They were expecting him. Paul Barra, you know, one of the greatest storytellers in the history of the business, laid down a beautiful foundation. And when Kane showed up, we blew the house off the building. Now, one, one, I asked for questions earlier today, and I got a lot of really good ones, and I want to try to get through them all. The first one was by Main Event Podcast. And they said, was Kane's character built with Glenn Jacobs in mind, or did he just fill the bill of what was being um, what was being looked for? I have to say this, and again, you know, for a guy who doesn't give credit to where credit is due, you know, Vince Russo, I remember sitting in Vince McMahon's um, um, dining room. That that's where we wrote creative. We sat in Vince McMahon's dining room, and I remember it was myself. Uh, Vince, I don't remember who else was there, but I know Bruce Pritchard was there because this was the first time that Bruce Pritchard laid out the story of Kane to me. And listen, man, you can you can go back and look at my I just did an interview with Bruce Pritchard for a couple of hours on VinceRussoBrand.com. And I say this, Bruce and I have had some of our differences in the past. Listen, you're going to have differences with people. That's that's just a part of life. But I love Bruce. Uh, you know, Bruce really gave me my start in the business as a writer. Uh, you know, he kind of, you know, took me under his wing, taught me the ins and outs a little bit. I'll never be able to thank him enough for that. One thing I always say about Bruce Pritchett is Bruce Pritchett is the greatest storyteller in the history of the wrestling business. If you ever want to spend a night with anybody, I'm telling you, put Bruce Pritchard up at that list. Bruce has been around for a very, very, very long time. I believe he started with the WWE right around WrestleMania three or so. Um, but um, boy, can can Bruce tell a story? He becomes the character. He becomes so excited, so emotional. And I remember him telling me about 
undertake his brother Cain, who didn't exist at the time. And he was telling me there was a fire that Taker accidentally set. And, you know, he thought his brother was killed in it, but he wasn't. And he was badly burned. I mean, he laid out this beautiful story. So the, the concept of Cain came from Bruce Pritchard. No doubt about it. Hands down. Great idea. Great character. Great backstory. Now, I, I, I don't believe, you know, Bruce could probably answer this question better than I. Um, I don't believe that the uh, the character was created for Glenn Jacobs. I believe that, you know, Bruce had this character in his mind. Bruce was very close with Taker. Him and Taker were best friends. So, you know, Taker's story was was always Bruce's priority when Bruce was involved in the creative. But so I don't believe that he had Glenn Jacobs in mind. Um, you know, but the fact of the matter is um, uh, he knew the story. He knew it inside and out. And I mean, it played out to fruition. Um, and all the credit in the world to the character goes to uh, the Kane goes to Bruce. As far as the character himself, Glenn Jacobs, let me say this again. Here we are 18 years later and Glenn Jacobs is in the main event at, you know, the hell in the cell against the champion, you know, Seth Rollins. Glenn Jacobs is probably the nicest guy I've ever had the privilege of working with in the wrestling business. And I know I say that a lot. Listen, there are a lot of nice guys. There are a lot of a-holes, but there are a lot of nice guys. You know, Kurt Angle, you know, I, I can't say enough. You know, Mick Foley, the list goes on and on and on. Glenn Jacobs was one of those guys, the nicest guy you would ever want to meet. So when we put him in this role and it started – taking off i was really happy for glenn because in my opinion you know he deserved nothing but the best uh you know so again this same night was the debut of kane uh you know the music here he comes in the arena vince mcmahon going nuts ripping that that door off of the cage you know Quite frankly, arguably, that may have been the um, the greatest intro to any character in the history of the wrestling business. I mean, you, I think you'd really have to go back and look if any other character on their first night had any more impact than Kane did. Now, listen, I was there when Taker uh, um, um, previewed. And there was some, uh, there was, uh, you know, of course, you know, that was a great um, uh, character and it had a lot of impact. But here's the thing. Here's what it didn't have. It didn't have Paul Bearer before Taker. Paul Bearer was the one responsible for, like I said, laying this beautiful story that Bruce Pritchard had crafted, laying this out and building the anticipation and building the anticipation. So he got Kane over before Kane even got there. So then when Glenn slash Kane made that debut, it's what everybody wanted and more. But, you know, it was also a little bit more important than that. When you watch the Raws that follow, you know, we booked Kane and we wrote Kane like an absolute monster. I mean, he would go on to kill everybody off the bat. Uh, you know, just another thing I, I think the business is lacking today. Uh, you know, just there's a lot of inconsistency. So they're not consistently getting a character over. A character maybe takes two steps forward, one step back, a step forward, a step back. With Kane, it was total destruction from the beginning. And, you know, everybody was, holy crap, you know, the Undertaker has met his match. Um, but you know, again, listen, put for both the undertaker and both Kane 18 years later for them to be headlining a pay-per-view is the greatest testament that you could give to, uh, you know, just either competitor, um, just unbelievable, great human beings. They deserve everything they've ever gotten in the business. I want to go through, um, some of these notes here. Because there's a lot of questions about, uh, you know, of course, the, the Mick Foley-Undertaker match, uh, you know, which 
I, I listen when, when I think of wrestling matches, there are two matches that come to my mind immediately. Just just two matches. The two matches that come to my mind immediately are Steamboat Savage WrestleMania three, and and Hell in a Cell with Taker and Mick. Those are the two matches that come to mind immediately. And speaking of Savage, I want to get to this question because. Um, Randy Helms said to me, "Can you talk about wrestlers whom never had have been in a, have been in Hell in a Cell, but would have been awesome in that type of a match?" With that being said, I had to go through the list of who actually did Hell in a Cell matches because there was a long period of time there. I got to be honest with you, where I wasn't following WWE wrestling. I mean, a good good patch. So I really had to go back and look at all the people that had been in the hell of the cell matches. The one person that jumped out at me because this match kind of came after he left was the macho man, Randy Savage. I can't imagine what Savage would have done in a hell in a cell match. And the first thing that immediately comes to mind is a Savage Michaels match in hell of a cell, both athletes in their prime um i cannot even imagine what that match would have looked like so randy uh you know immediately uh, uh coming off the top of my head no doubt about it the macho man randy savage um man 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 would that have been something to see um i'm just i i just want to make sure i get um i, I get all this over okay another, a different randy asked me what was my favorite hell in a cell match obviously it was um, it was uh, Undertaker and McFoley for uh, obvious reasons. I mean, I was watching the match in the back, you know, sitting at the gorilla position right at the other side of the uh, of the curtain, and I have to tell you, I could not believe what I was seeing. I, I just I could not believe this, and there was a point in the match. Uh, where I really started, I started getting concerned for the health and the well-being of Mick Foley. Uh, the bumps that he took that night, I, I don't know if any other human being could have endured them. I, I mean, I, I just, I don't know. When I watched that monitor, I mean, I was, you know, flabbergasted. I was I was in awe. I was in shock. I was in fear. I mean, forget about wrestling being a work. Put all that aside. I was, I, I was so concerned that Mick was going to lay it all out there, literally, that nothing was going to be left. And I tell the story. I just had Mick on uh, on one of the shows, and I told him this story, and we talked about the Hell of a Cell match. Uh, you know, Mick told me that you know it was it was actually Terry Funk's idea for Mick to start the match by crawling up the side and getting on top. Uh, and 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 I talked to Mick about you know my memories of the match, and the thing I remember most was this: after this epic match was over. I literally was waiting on that curtain on the other side to see if Mick was okay. That was my greatest concern, you know, not to tell him that, you know, this match was going to be talked about for 20 years later. I was really worried about the man's health. So they wheeled Mick back in a gurney um, and, and the WWE, one of the trainers was over him. It was a man called Francois, uh, you know, a Frenchman. Uh, you know, who claimed to have been in the foreign legion at, at one point, but a character within itself. I, I, read my book. I talk a lot about Francois. Anyway, we're wheeling him back. Francois is looking at Mick, checking over his body. And I remember Francois leaves for a second. And there was a period of time where it was just Mick and I in the back. And I'll never forget this. Mick's body is battered and bruised. He's half out of it. His teeth, like, were up through his lip. Um, man, I was really worried about him. And and I remember, you know, by I was by his side, and he was, you know, kind of out of it. And I remember him looking up at me, and he said to me, with a smile on his face, he said, Vince, was the match better than Sean's? And my knee-jerk reaction was, I said to Mick, are you out of your freaking mind? 
because all I could think about was Mick's beautiful wife, Mick's beautiful family, his kids who were very young at the time. He could have literally, you know, crippled himself, paralyzed himself that night. And at the end of the day, the performer that he was with, with, with the pride he had, his only concern was, was the match better, uh, you know, than Sean's. If that doesn't tell you everything you need to know about Mick Foley, well, I, you know, quite frankly, I don't know what else to say. But there are, a, I got a lot of questions about the Foley Taker match, and that's what I want to uh, answer now. And one of them blew me away because I didn't even remember this, but it came from it came from Wrestling Inc. Actually. And it said, um, how was Mick's condition when he did the run in in the Austin Cage match in, in the Austin Kane match at King of the Ring, which was after the hell in the cell match against Taker? I, I, listen, Wrestling Inc., whoever threw this question is, I hope your facts are straight because I got to be honest with you. I don't remember this. And you asking me this question. I don't know how in the world Mick Foley could have done a run-in in a match later on in the night after what he had put his body through in that match with Taker. Uh, I, I have no idea. I don't remember it. But when I read the question, you know, my first response was, are you freaking kidding me? This guy did a run-in after that match. Would that happen today? I, I mean, honestly, you know, not to take anything away from any of the athletes today. They're all great. But honestly, like, would any other human being be capable of having that kind of a match and, and coming back later uh, for a run-in? Um, just absolutely, absolutely uh, unbelievable. Let me, let me, I want to make sure I get all my uh, questions. Uh, yeah, um, uh, 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 uh Aaron Bon Shiamo, I think that's how you say his name. Uh, Aaron Ben Shiamo asked, uh, you know, what was my first reaction when Mick fell through the cage, which was wasn't supposed to happen. You know, Mick came on my show. He explained all that, but I, you know, like I said, I was I was scared to death for the guy, even though this was Mick Foley, and you know, he he had you believe in he was invincible. And he had you believing that no matter what he did, he was going to come out of it okay. Uh, when I saw that, I was absolutely horrified. I, I, I think that's where it really kicked in where, you know, okay, I forgot this is a wrestling show. I forgot this is a work. Now I'm really concerned about the uh, man's, you know, well-being and health, uh, you know, at, at that point in the time in the match. There was another question. Um Oh, yeah. uh, Ego, Ego Game City asked me, did anyone get a talking to when the roof fell through? Uh, again, that wasn't supposed to happen. That wasn't by design. That wasn't planned, you know, according to Mick. So if that's the case, you know, I don't think anybody would get a talking to, uh, you know, if that wasn't planned, if, if, if they didn't rig that without anybody else knowing. And, you know, like I said, Mick's story is that wasn't supposed to happen. And I, I believe Mick. I don't think Mick would be working anybody, uh, you know, 15 years after the fact or however long it was. So, you know, stuff like that happens in a match. So, you know, I, I don't I don't think either combatant or participant, um, you know, would have got a talking down to if something happened that that wasn't supposed to happen, according to Mick. But I, I tend to believe Mick. Uh, my favorite Hell in a Cell match was far and away that one. Okay, so I, I want to get into something else here. So there you have a little bit of a history, the first match between uh, how the Cell came about, the first match between Taker and and um, Shawn Michaels of Bad Blood. Kane made his debut um, October 7th, was it? October 5th, 1977, 18 years ago, heading into this pay-per-view. People ask me for my predictions at a pay-per-view. I, I, listen, I hate to use the word predictions because these matches are worked. I mean, we're writing a winner and a loser. And, you know, maybe I look at it more that way because I am a writer. So when somebody tells me to predict a winner, you know, it's not like I'm predicting, uh, you know, you know who's going to win between the Royals and, and Toronto and go to the World Series. 
you know, it's I'm predicting something that's predetermined. So I feel silly doing that. So basically what I would say is as a writer, this is how I would book it. And I would book, you know, both of the matches, the Hell in the Cell match um, with Lesnar and Taker and the match with Rollins and Kane. I would book them more or less the same. And I'll tell you why. Listen, Lesnar's the guy. Lesnar's Lesnar is perhaps the most believable wrestler I've ever seen since I've been watching wrestlers. Well, since I've been watching wrestling, uh, you know, which goes back to like 1972, 1973. This guy's the most believable monster. Um, as a shoot, no nobody could take him on, on the WWE roster. Nobody would come even close. I mean, let, let's call a spade a spade. He's, he's still in his prime. He has many, many years to go in the WWE, hopefully. So he's the guy. So in my opinion, I understand where the WWE is coming from that. You know, they want to protect Taker. They want to protect Taker. They want to protect Taker. And I understand that. But I also understand, you know, business is business. And it's what they're always talking about. So when I look at it, I look at two things. First of all, Taker's not going to be able to wrestle forever. Um, you know, let's face it. He's not the dead man. He's not the undertaker. He's a human being, you know, you know, skin, blood, bones, you know, and he breaks like everybody else. And the older you get, the harder and harder uh, it, it is to do what he does, especially at the level he does it at. So he's got to be coming to the end of the line where he's going to be able to have really good wrestling matches. On the other hand, you've got this beast um, in the prime of his life in the ring uh, against a man, um, you know, into his 50s. I think Brock has to have a decisive win over Taker. I, I mean, I just do. I mean, almost to the point of, you know, Taker saying after the match, that was the last match. I can't do this again. Uh, you know, Brock Lesnar, you know, just ended it. Yeah, You know, I mean, real put Brock over. Now, I'm not saying Brock go out there and kill Taker and Taker gets nothing in and it's embarrassing and one-sided. I'm not saying that at all. But obviously, the story of the match should be that Brock has more stamina than Taker. He's young, a lot younger than Taker. Taker's never going to quit. There's going to be no, no, no quitting in Taker. He's going to keep trying to come back and back and back. Lesnar puts him over by, you know, not believing I can't put this guy away till finally Brock beats him. Boom, clean. One, two, three, decisive. I don't know if you go as far as Brock helping take her up and all that, but Brock's the guy. You got to give him a decisive victory. Yes, we have to protect Taker, but I think that's how you protect him. Taker's not a guy that's going to ever give up, and he's going to keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back till there's nothing left. That's how I would book it. That's me. Rollins in my opinion, as a WWE champion, needs more of a decisive win than anybody on that roster. Listen, I, I, I've said this time and time and time again, and I don't want to get into it. I think they've hurt Rollins with the way they've written his character. You know, one week he has balls. The next week he's a wuss. The next week he's got balls. The next week he's a wuss. The next week he's got balls. We don't know who Seth Rollins is. I thought they had a good opportunity for him to go off on his own and earned some credibility after he beat Dean Ambrose on his own when he said he didn't need anybody. But rather than go in that direction, he went backwards and he started kowtowing to Triple H again and, you know, all that stuff, which I thought really, really hurt him. I would love to see a decisive win over Kane. Beat Kane. L listen, nobody, I, I don't think there's anybody that believes that Rollins is just going to have a decisive victory over Kane because, you know, they've, they've painted Rollins as a chicken shit heel. Rollins runs away. Rollins does this. That's how they've painted the guy. But if you give him a decisive victory over Kane, you're going to look at this man differently. And again, I understand you got to protect Kane, but going back to business, 
Kane is in the twilight of his career. You know, Kane has been around for a very long time, 18 years as an active wrestler on the WWE roster. You know, Rollins is the future. Rollins is your champ right now. You got to build Rollins. So no disrespect for Kane. You got to cover him in the match. But Rollins, in my opinion, needs a decisive victory. So, like, I'm not predicting they'll do either one of those two things. What I'm telling you is, as the booker, uh, if I were writing the show, that's the way I would book both of those matches. So there you got a little history lesson, not much of a rant today. It didn't really, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the nuclear heat really didn't come out in anybody. Maybe it'll be back next week. Depends on what goes on during the week. But I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you, you enjoyed a little trip down memory lane, little insights of being that I had the honor and the, prev and, and the privilege and the pleasure of being present for all that. So listen, I want to thank the, uh, WrestlingInc.com for allowing me to bring you Nuclear Heat. Also remember, uh, Monday nights, WrestlingInc.com after Raw. I'm part of a review show that I think you'll find extremely entertaining. Um, I uh, Also, I just conducted an interview with Ed Ferrara on WrestlingInc.com. I think you'll find it entertaining. Ed's an NXT fan. I'm not an NXT fan. We have a very good conversation about that. Uh, outside of that, you can follow me weekly. I do video podcasts, uh, columns, everything on VinceRussoBrand.com. So thanks for joining me, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Have a great day.